Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another Hamilton Wealth Partners Fund Manager webinar. My name's Kane Barrino, and I'm a partner at Hamilton Wealth. The format for today's webinar, it'll be a bit more conversational than previous webinars, so do feel free to submit any questions you have in the Zoom taskbar below throughout the webinar, and I'll try and incorporate these into the discussion. So I'll now read a quick um, advice warning, and then I'll introduce our guest speaker. The information contained in this webinar has been provided as general advice only. The contents have been prepared without taking account of your objectives, financial situation or needs. You should, before you make any decisions regarding any information, strategies or products mentioned in this webinar, consult your advisor to consider whether that is appropriate having regard to your objectives, financial situation and needs. Okay, so today I'll be joined by Alan McFarlane from Dundas Global Investors. Alan's investment career began in 1980 in private equity at what is now 3i Group. He joined Ivory and Syme in 83 to manage global equity portfolios. Before starting Dundas in 2010, he was CEO of Walter Scott and Partners, an Edinburgh-based global equity manager, which was acquired by BNY Mellon in 2006. He's a former chair of the Endowment Fund of the University of Edinburgh and holds a degree in politics and modern history from the same institution. So some of you also may remember that Alan was kind enough to present for us in what was our first ever Hamilton Wealth Partners webinar, which we hosted in April last year, which was shortly after the, the world as we knew it changed forever. So 12 months on, I'll, I'll commence by asking you, Alan, you know, what's happened? Yes, thank you, Kay, and thank you for the introduction. So uh, today, in, uh, at the end of April 2021, um, I think we can now look back and uh, make more sense of what happened. Let's, let's start with the obvious. The, um, the world had uh, really, a, in many respects, a public policy-induced recession. People would have responded to the pandemic personally. There, there's clear evidence that people took fewer flights, uh, people in China were, were behaving differently in the early stages, but the effect in uh, most countries worldwide was imposed by governments. We, we used to think wealth was in things like gold and land, they're still important, but we know that the greatest wealth, uh, the wealth of the world, rests on exchange between people. And we exchange goods and services for our resources. And what, um, sending people home did was curtail exchange. Now the OECD, the, the club of the world's biggest economies has published uh, its figures. It suggests that the world, the world economy shrank by 3.4% last year. There was a lot of variety. Um, the uh, China grew having shrunk very sharply at the beginning of the year, um, but all other major economies in the OECD universe uh, shrank. So we've just had a recession quite a nasty recession um, induced by public policy. So that's the first thing that's happened. The second thing that's happened, which may seem contradictory, is we've had uh, a banner year for global equities. Now, the, the index I'm going to refer to, I probably won't refer to any others, but the index I'm going to refer to is uh, the MSCI uh, All Country World Index. So it's an index that comprises developed and emerging markets. It's the one we look at because it's the biggest uh, opportunity. It's about 2000 companies worldwide. And together they represent something approaching 95% or 90 plus percent of all available market capitalization. So it's a fair reflection of the whole and how it, how it did. It was the kind of banner year that um, you know, people in my job and at Hamilton Wealth will be advising folks to stay the course and to stay fully invested. Um, we usually issue that advice uh, in tough times, and, and it's correct to do it. But if you don't hang on for years of the kind that we have just experienced, you don't, you don't achieve the long-term returns that are um, not promised, but indicated by studies of past returns. So just to give you an indication, um, that index I was talking about uh, by the 23rd of March last year had fallen 32%. So it was, it was the old story that it was, it was sell on the prospect and the news. And then we went into lockdown. Um, from that low point <clears throat> on the 23rd of March, 
um, the world index rose 68% uh, from that point, um, which meant that for um, uh, the uh, year as a whole, equities returned 14%. It's as if nothing happened. I mean, that's a really good year. Um, but from 23rd March last year, the low, to 23rd March this year, a month ago, global equities rose 75%. So uh, this really was one for the ages. And uh, if you were invested in it, even if you're, you didn't have index matching or beating performance, um, happy days. The one thing I'd like to highlight though is um, when we received a very kind invitation to, uh, to speak to Hamilton Wealth and its clients on the 7th of April last year, that was the first call we did in discussion about what was, what was happening. And I'm going to sum up at the end with some of the remarks we made. Um, Mr. Market, stock markets bring low the proud very quickly. We met two weeks after markets had bottomed. So we were discussing what to do and how to approach it. And the bus was already accelerating away from the terminus. And it was on that 75% journey over the, uh, we were two weeks into a 52 week uh, period with a 75% rally. Too many numbers, but it was dramatic. And uh, I don't recall um, implying that there was any likelihood of retesting the lows or what the highs would be. That's not what we do. And I don't recall anybody in particular asking whether or not it was time to um, uh, dissolve one's equity portfolio. But it just highlights that what we think we are speaking about with some authority is happening independent of us and our job is to be aligned with that rather than to pretend that we can impose ourselves on it so um that was uh that was fascinating thank you very much alan so what what have been the key learnings over the last 12 months in some respects uh kane it's been uh, a recital of things we knew already we, we know that equities are volatile series um and I know that in Australia, there's not many defined benefit pension plans left. The superannuation system is a defined contribution system. But um, here in the UK, uh, until about 10 or 15 years ago, the dominant form of a corporate pension plan was a defined benefit plan. And that's a very tricky thing because you're promising someone. And the way that, the way the UK systems worked was that when you retired, my dad got this, when, when he retired, um, he was paid a portion of his salary until he died. And that, that had some inflation linkage in it. So... It needs only a moment's thought to realize that's an incredibly complex problem to work out when he starts his work, when he starts, when you start a job in your 20s and if you retire in your 60s and you might live to your 90s, is what rate of return do you assume? And so the actuarial profession, and if we've got any on the call, please speak up later, um, when they, uh, had to they had to recommend how much should you save to achieve that final salary pension, they have to come up with numbers for the smooth return of equity markets. And over the last hundred years, global equities in US dollars have returned about five and a half percent per annum real um, compound. The only problem with that is I can't think of a year in which markets went up five and a half percent. They go up 14 or 50 or they go down 20 or they're all over the place. But the long run compound um, is remarkably it's not perfect. There are, there are 30 and 40 year periods that, that, that vary, but it's reliable enough that you can build a, a 60 year savings plan around it. And so the message of last year is these things happen. These things happen. I was making a list for somebody uh, last week in the time we've been in business, Russia uh, re-annexed Crimea. Uh, uh, Fukushima happened. Uh, we started investing in uh, August, 2011 when the Greek crisis, the Greek tragedy was, was you know, the chorus was singing and we're going into the fourth act. Um, so things happen. This thing has been on a scale unseen, certainly since the AIDS crisis, but that wasn't as pervasive. And since the 1919 flu pandemic. So to say that all of the other things I've mentioned are equal um, doesn't really apply. But the things we've learned are capitalism adapts businesses adapt, and I'm going to talk about one or two of those um, in a minute. Um, uh, investors shouldn't, uh, they should adapt 
in terms of where they invest, but the general principles of staying invested for the long term, because that's where your returns come from, not trading. Um, those, are, those are the things we've learned. I suppose the one, the one final thing um, I would say in this is we've learned that, um, that the playbook for how to deal with recession that was first advanced in the 1930s in quite a clumsy way uh, of deficit financing and liquidity. Um, and it was, it was arguably Japan didn't get it right in the late, in the, after 1989, um, but certainly in the US since 94 um, and the main, the main recessionary and financial market problems we've had since then, governments have reliably increased deficits and made more and more liquidity available. Um, good for them. Uh, there's a question of how many times that magic trick can be repeated um, before it loses its force, but it did not fail on this occasion. Thank you. So you mentioned you're going to talk about some of these companies and, you know, which ones have adapted the best, um, yeah, over the last 12 months? Well, it, it, it's unthinkable that any company had no adaptation. So everyone's had to deal with this. The most obvious ones, and I, I speak as someone who has had one vaccine, uh, one vaccination, and my wife's had two. Um, the first thing is uh, the vaccine manufacturers, the supply chains that started delivering things to our doors, um, all of those, uh, they've transformed uh, their businesses. But what I thought would be useful was to pick three companies that are in our portfolio, and I suspect are in the daily lives of the majority of the people on this call. Uh, and if not in their daily lives, their children's or their colleagues' uh, daily lives, and just indicate some of the things um, that have changed. Revolutions, um, people think of them on a single day. I know Australia's history is not particularly revolutionary, um, uh, but if you think of the countries that are the, the, the big countries that have undergone really powerful revolutions, um, and the obvious one is, is, is Russia, former Soviet Union, um, the revolution happens, and the day after, you can't imagine going back to where you were before, even though it, have may, it may have taken a long time getting there. So let's think of three examples where that's true. Revolution number one um, is the revolution of uh, cash ceasing to be the principal means of exchange um, of goods and services and payment for them. Um, we've known that for a long time. You can see it in the accounts of the Australian banks um, and banks around the world. Uh, the most obvious manifestation is the, uh, you know, we shifted from branches to holes in the wall, credit cards, and now we have digital payment uh, means. And the one that we're invested in is a company called PayPal. And PayPal began, in fact, Elon Musk was one of the earlier investors in it. PayPal began uh, 25 years ago, and for a long time it was owned by eBay, which wanted to have an easy means of payment, because you didn't know who the vendor was of the thing you'd bid on or bought. And PayPal was nurtured within eBay, and then they split, and, and PayPal um, stands alone. Um, in a year, and the reason I, I, this is why I read out the GDP numbers for the world, so the global economy shrank 3.4%. PayPal's um, transaction value growth was up 31% in 2020. And so a lot of the trends that we've seen of more and more use of debit cards at the expense of cash, now what we're seeing is the use of online transactions at the expense of physical presentation of cards. Um, and even where those cards are presented uh, physically, just as an aside, here in the UK, it used to be you could tap your card for a... 10 pound transaction. Uh, and because I haven't been out using mine very much, but I believe the number has gone up in two leaps towards 50 pounds. So there's cash you won't carry again um, uh, because of that. But from PayPal's standpoint, it's secure, it's digital, it's reliable, it's easy to use. They had um, a record uh, increase in the number of net active subscribers on the system that went up 95% and they now have 380 million um, uh, accounts. The key number, um, and unfortunately, I've got, I've got it as a picture, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to infer what they said here. Um, but if you look at payment transactions per minute, 
the peak that PayPal had reached in, in prior years was fairly stable. It had reached about 32 million transactions per minute. By December last year, they'd broken 50 for the first time. Now, that's because we were at home. That's because our exchanges were taking place digitally. They weren't taking place personally. And PayPal might not sound like a revolution. As it stands just now, 14%, 15% of world retail transactions um, are, are, are non-cash. Their, their cards are digital. So there's miles to run um, for this to continue. But 2020 was the year there was no turning back. One final thing about PayPal that uh, I thought was particularly interesting. Um, some of you, I know Amazon's been in Australia now for a few years. Um, here in the UK, I use Amazon all the time, mildly resent it, uh, the amount of information and money that I, that I send to them. And other retailers have struggled to catch up. But I've noticed in the last few weeks that if you go onto the online version of a retail shop, say in London, um, where you would buy a shirt, for example, and um, you get to the checkout, and if you use PayPal, PayPal now auto-populates all the, all the delivery details for the retailer. You don't have to tap, it's all that tapping in has gone a tiny thing, but a gigantic liberation for companies that didn't want to get involved in all of that. The second one I wanna talk about um, is a different kettle of fish. It's, it's the Disney company. Um, and you know, I would defy anyone in this call to, to say they've had no contact with Disney. National Geographic is owned by Disney. Um, so even if you didn't like the cartoons or Star Wars, you're, you're connected with Disney. Um, Disney had a terrible year. Disney's revenues were down 22%. Net income in the year ended uh, December 2019 was $2 billion. It was 29 million. That was nothing um, last year. Um, so what was so great about Disney? Well, Disney had seen the effect of Netflix. And Disney, uh, under the uh, its prior chief executive, now chairman, made a series of uh, investments and acquisitions to give itself the ability to have direct to consumer contact. So Disney used to make its products available via cable channels in America, via cinemas, via TV channels. It owns a TV channel, but it can't own all of them. Um, and these were, these were remunerated in various ways, uh, advertising, fees, uh, so on. But in the years uh, leading up to 2019, Disney had made a number of transactions, including with uh, uh, the Murdoch family when Rupert decided to get out of um, mo most of 21st, 20th century uh, Fox's assets and Disney bought them. And one of those assets is a Netflix lookalike called Hulu. If you've watched The Handmaid's Tale, um, Hulu was originated that. Uh, Disney has taken its ESPN sports streaming service and in addition to making it available via cable channels, it's now available on subscription. It's called ESPN Plus. But the most important one is Disney Plus, which it launched in 2019. Now, I was looking this morning for the uh, precise forecasts that Disney issued. And of course, couldn't find them. But my recollection is that um, in the first quarter last year, so January, February, March, Disney had an announcement uh, or a meeting where they were reporting results. And they reckon that by 2022 or 23, um, they might get 60 million subscribers. What they didn't know was that um, every young couple around the world with children, where both of them were working, had to use um, planking them down in front of a screen more than they would otherwise have done. And most of those people rely on Disney's product. It's safe, it's educational, it's uplifting, all the things they want it to be. Um, Disney Plus, as of January this year, has 95 million subscribers. So they just got 1.5 times their 2023 target in a moment. Hulu uh, is up 30%, ESPN's up uh, uh, more. And more importantly than all of those numbers, and they are really important, but there's now Disney subscription services in India and Indonesia. They get much lower prices, but they're in as, as those economies thrive. So there's an example of a, of a company hammered by its park closures, hammered by the cruise lines, not being the, the Disney cruises. Um, and its financials show that it's not been an easy time, but that revolution has taken off uh, for Disney. And the final one, which in a sense is the big daddy of them all, um, is uh, Microsoft, which just last night announced its results. And so I'm able to 
uh, report them to you. Now, this, this is a company um, that in the three months ended uh, March 31st, reported um, revenues of $41 billion. So, th so the run rate now is uh, $160 billion per annum. This is no small thing. Those revenues were up, remember, against the global economy that shrank 3.4%. Microsoft's revenues were up 19%. Now, what drove that? Um, the Azure cloud business, the, the file storage business, um, LinkedIn, um, the a bad job market, people looking to, to find more, connect with people, Microsoft Office 365, and Microsoft Dynamics, which is its equivalent to, to Salesforce, and some of its gaming products. Those are the details. The key is to think about what's happened to Microsoft and what's happened to us and what the future might look like. I remember Bill Gates and MS-DOS, and I used to do a teeny bit of MS-DOS fiddling around with the arrows and the black, the white lettering on the black keyboard on the blackboards. And then for 25 years, I, my, my Microsoft subscription, whoever was paying it, was updated in disks. And we put those disks in and the computer worked on its own and you stored the information. And Office 365 um, or Microsoft Office was, was okay. It was quite clunky, but it was better than, as a suite, it was better. And as, as time passed, and Microsoft made some howlers of mistakes um, through those middle years of the late 90s and early 2000s. But in the last few years, Microsoft has evolved its activities now so that with an, O3, an Office 365 subscription, you don't have any disks. You can use it in multiple devices. Um, Excel, Word, uh, Outlook, um, connects to LinkedIn. The old Skype product is still there. I've used it in lockdown, but Teams has taken over and you can store everything in Azure. Now, what does that do? That means instead of me using my computer at work, wherever I've got a device, I'm working. I've got access to every single thing I need. I can have a call, I can do anything I want with a decent Wi-Fi connection, and I can store all my material and share it with colleagues. And here we are now thinking about the home office balance. I, I, you know, All three of our children are are married and have children of their own and in most cases it's two of them working and they're trying to work out how to get all these things working for them and Microsoft says yeah we can do that we've, we've got that so having lived through the PC revolution in static places Microsoft has now got a perfect suite doesn't mean there's it's risk-free but as it stands for one of the world's biggest companies to grow its revenues 19 percent for PayPal's activity to grow 33%, for Disney to get 95 million subscriptions, we have seen a revolution and that revolution will only continue. Well, thank you very much, Ellen. You've given some great you know, examples of companies that have ad adapted. W what are some of the big, you know, the broader investment lessons that you have learned over the last 12 months? <clears throat> I want to start with a quote from my favorite Marxist, um, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Um, I, I did a bit of history, you, heard, you said at the beginning, I did a bit of history and politics at university, and Lenin is, is one of the most remarkable people of the last 150 years. Um, he, he wrote a lot, one of his books is behind me, um, uh, uh, and there's a, there's a comment which is believed to be from him. It sounds like him, and he said this, and we've, we've put this in one or two of our reports to clients, so it may be in the fund report, if you're able, if you're, if any of your investors are looking at it, he 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 is alleged to have said this: there are decades where nothing happens. That was Scotland in the 1960s, by the way, um, and there are weeks when decades happen. And we've had a decade in the last year. Now, the reason we've put that in our client reports was it was triggered by this remark from Microsoft's chief executive made in April last year. It's uncannily similar. We've seen two years worth of digital transformation in two months. From, from remote teamwork and learning to sales and customer service to critical cloud infrastructure and security, we are working alongside customers every day to help them adapt and stay open for business in a world of remote everything. Now, Lenin's revolution didn't last. It was misconceived. It was violent. It was absurd. Mr. Nadella's revolution is none of the above. 
and has opportunity for every single one of us. So if there's one thing we learned in the last 12 months, you were the first, I talked about you being the first session we had um, uh, of this type in lockdown. We had a few more afterwards, but you were also an early partner in which we test drove our motto. And our motto is that to invest successfully for the long term, you must take the oath of optimism. And the reason we like to couple it was oath is firm, it's serious, it's determined, you shouldn't break it. Optimism is considered, you know, it's, it's not cheerfulness, it's a determination to, to see the positive. You know there are bad things coming, but you, you keep that optimistic view. And the oath of optimism is that you will not be daunted. And, and that in pursuit of your retirement savings or the management of other people's money as we've got responsibility for and, and so on, that you, that you stick to that view. 2020 told us that optimism yet again was the winner. And it uh, doesn't mean there won't be bad times. Now, I do recall saying that last year, 72% lower in markets than we are today and saying you should stay the course and stay invested. Now, I, uh, I have an interest in this. I've never sold a share in our sister fund here in the UK to the one we have in Australia. And I have no intention of, and all my family members are invested and we just have some clients alongside us. I don't know anything about bonds. I don't know anything about private equity now. I don't know anything about alternatives. These are, these are serious things and they're options that you have. And fortunately you're working in this case with a firm that takes all of that seriously and helps you come to those judgments. So we're biased. We're not in a position to offer that kind of advice. But the advice we can offer, and we offer it by example, not by uh, voice, is what we do in the fund ourselves. And we invest for the long term. And yes, markets are cheaper today, are more expensive today, or, or higher, that's a better word, higher than they were a year ago. But if you're invested for a five to seven to 10 year period, you, you can't pick your moment. And the drawback, and I've heard a lot of people saying recently, well, is this time to take profits? No doubt it is. Yeah, but take profits in something and buy something else. But the notion of getting off the train, I thought 2020's great lesson was, um, I used to describe this as like Scottish rural bus services. And it, it, was, a, it was a serious thing because my mother was, um, uh, she, she worked in a hospital about 15 miles from where we lived. And she worked on night duty and um, she had to get there by bus. And the, the, the bus timetable was reliable. It was like the actuaries 5% per annum. The bus timetable worked, but it didn't always work exactly. So if there were, if they said there'll be two buses in an hour. There'll be two buses in an hour on the half hour and then the hour. Sometimes it was in the 50 minutes past and then it was the one at the hour. They came along together. Well, that's what equity markets are like. You, you, you know the timetable is reliable. The individual driver may get caught up in traffic or he may have a nice you know, green light run and he might get there a few minutes early. We had a green light run last year when the BBC News, I had to turn it off at one point. I just couldn't take it anymore. It was all what was wrong and there was plenty wrong. But the great lesson from 2020 is the oath of optimism works. And the only advice I have is the advice I take, stick to it. Well, thank you very much. Now, yeah, like I mentioned before, feel free to submit questions. I'll, I'll start with one and it's it's on your last point there, Alan. On, on the oath of optimism, you know, you sort of touched on this already, but is it harder to take that today than it was 12 months ago, just given? Um, you know. let, let's do, is it hard today? And then let, let's do the comparison. I think the reason that it's hard today is that people um, see big rises and if you if you've been outside of it or underweight in it you see the big rise and there's no annoyance greater than an opportunity cost um, particularly if your friends and family have it come to the same conclusion as you um, so there's nothing worse than a friend doing well when you've decided to be sober and prudent um, so it's understandable all of these things hold us back but as I was trying to point out, when we met on 7th of April and you know, Hamilton Wealth timed that, the first available moment, you were right in there, you had something to say, and the bus had gone two weeks earlier. 
And I didn't know that at the time. I just knew that markets were up a bit. You didn't know that. But the, the, the advice was, well, if you're going to invest for the long haul, invest for the long haul and try and put today's level out your mind. Now, we've also got questions about inflation. We've got questions about interest rates. We've got questions about China has been flying some fighters up and down the Taiwan Straits a bit more. There's the Indian COVID looks like it's out of control. Will there be a third wave? What's the efficacy of the vaccines? Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's always things to think about. But what I've tried to do this morning, is, uh, this afternoon for you, is point out that at Disney and at Microsoft and at PayPal, the world is continuing and changing towards those profitable activities and away from the others. So what you're really dealing with is not whether what India's COVID rate will be, and that's a horrible question. What you're dealing with is whether you can stand by while PayPal compounds at those rates. And, and if you think of it that way, you change the perspective. Now, in terms of comparison from last year, truthfully, I've, I've been in enough sessions. I've, that's why I've got gray hair. I've been in enough sessions over the year where um, uh, mildly angry investors, because it's always your fault, um, are telling me markets are down and you're down. Okay, you might not be down as much, but it's still down. What are you going to do about it? That's easy. That's fallen off a log. Every half decent fund manager knows that markets tend to rise. So in some respects, today's trickier um, because of the scale of the rally. But Mr. Nadella is telling us that he sees no end to his revolution and I wish to be associated with him. Well, thank you. Um, the Dundas philosophy talks a lot about sustainable dividends, which come from sustainable earnings. Can you put this sort of in perspective, given, you know, a lot of the top performing high growth companies, they don't have much in the way of earnings. So how have you navigated through all of that? Well, of the, of the three we discussed this morning, oddly enough, it's the older company, Disney, that doesn't have the earnings at the moment because the parks are closed. And, and I think what you're referring to is that there, there, there are, and there have been in the last two or three years, some dramatic new technology companies in particular who've, who've gone public very early before they have profitability. Um, so what would, what, what would have been kept in the private and venture capital arena is now in the public arena. That doesn't change the great thrust of, of global, global markets. Last year, equities, equities worldwide paid $1.4 trillion of dividends. Um, this would be a different discussion for a different day, but it's fairly easy to demonstrate that the biggest component of long-run equity return is the compounding effect of dividends. And Australians know that because of the franking system. Um, it's, not, it's very good. It's, it has its imperfections, and we've seen some of them in the last, the last few years. So... Dividend, the great majority of companies worldwide, approaching 90% of them, pay cash dividends. Um, and the reason we've picked dividends is, one, it's, a, it's the biggest component of long-term return. So it's very, very important. And number two, uh, and this is a higher status for us, um, it's a marvelous way to look at how a company organizes itself and to understand its revenue, its profitability, its cash generation, and the, uh, the way that it treats its dividend. We want to invest in companies whose first priority is not to pay a dividend, but whose first priority is to reinvest to grow their business to support future dividends. So if you look at the payout ratios of some of the companies in Australia in recent years, they've been paying out 80 to 85% of their earnings. When the earnings collapsed, they had to cut the dividends. Um, that's a good example of the negative we find that a dividend disciplined growth strategy has been really powerful. We, we own Microsoft and I'll, I'll proclaim it out and proud. We own Microsoft because it's a great tech company, but we own it because we think its dividend is one of the most reliable ones in the world. Um, whereas last year, the banking sector, the biggest contributor to global dividends was cutting everywhere. This is a longer discussion, Kane, but mm -hmm. we think that, that we, we find that to be a robust, reliable way to discern which companies to invest in and as a discipline to, to guide us as we implement that oath of optimism. Okay, thank you. And, and another question sort of on a similar topic that, you know, the last 12 months, a lot of the performance has come from PE expansion. Um, so, you know, wh where is this growth going to come from going forward? Is it all going to be earnings or do you think there, you know, there will be more PE expansion to come? 
Uh, well, the PE expansion in the last year is because the earnings were down and people were uh, taking the view, supported by the liquidity and made available by central banks and governments, uh, supported by deficit financing, supported by uh, many of the income support programs, but, and all of those are important, but they pale into insignificance in that it would appear, something we've taken this view, that 2020, you, just, you have to look through it and look at what's coming out the other side. So you're quite right. PE has expanded because the E has fallen. The earnings have fallen and prices have gone up. So we're in a moment where um, some of the announcements we've heard about uh, companies' earnings not quite meeting what, what folks were hoping for or not quite getting back. Um, you know, what's the value of a Disney park that has nobody going to it? Um, well, no one else is going to be able to open a park. No one else could build one in the time available, et cetera, et cetera. There's pent up demand and so on. So if investors followed Disney's earnings, the share price would have been down 20 or 30%, they more than that this year. So there's been a looking through is, is part one. As earnings recover, I'll make the safest forecast I've ever made in my career. And I've made about two. So here's, here's one of them. The PE will fall this year because earnings will recover. The question is, to what extent? Now, where are earnings going to be problematic? Physical retailers, um, office owning companies as companies downsize. The aviation sector is going to be by far the most interesting one. Um, I would love to have done this in person. I'm fed up within these four walls. We're going up 150 miles north to the Scottish Highlands this weekend. I can't wait. Um, uh, I want to get in a plane. My ESG conscience can bear that, um, and it would be great to do that. But there's lots of finance directors who are going to say to mid-tier employees, you can do that meeting on Teams. Yep. You can do that meeting on Zoom. So we'll see. So some earnings won't recover, and others will compound ahead. PayPal, I think, for the reasons we've advanced, um, and others. We don't buy, I mean, we're not, we're not promoting the Vanguard Global Index Fund, and that is a fine thing. I'm an unmitigated fan of Vanguard, and I think a lot of investors who don't have access to the caliber of advice that Hamilton can offer, and modestly, I think we can contribute, um, that might be the right thing for them. Um, but we only invest in 2% of the opportunity. So our job is not to be anxious about the market. Our job is to be in the, the stocks that have the momentum of the kind I've described to you. Yeah, maybe just on that point, you're obviously bottom up stock pickers. Um, you know, you don't look at sort of, you know, where the value is based on country or region, but where are you finding most of the value on a global scale? Is a, have you sort of shifted the portfolio towards any country or region? Uh, if, if we did, it's it's the consequence of the stock picking you've mentioned. So it's 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 uh, it's a subsequent identifier, not a primary trigger to action. Um, so in the last in the last few weeks, so we've um, we've put a toe in the water with eBay, uh, which has been deeply problematic for the last ten years. It, it didn't participate. Uh, it was kind of stuck between the auction model and the sales model. We've seen other companies uh, come into its arena and compete very successfully, Amazon included. And there were some very strange uh, capital allocation decisions made by the eBay board, uh, mostly to do with share buybacks. But eBay had a very good 2020 because it was, it was set up and ready. And that thing about PayPal making it easy for the, the shirt shop in London to, to, to take my order because PayPal did all the, all the, all the data fulfillment and um, so on. eBay is moving in that direction as well with uh, things like fast and free deliveries, uh, making that better, being much more promotional for businesses that operate on eBay. Um, <clears throat> so that's taken us to a US equity, except more than half its revenue is outside the USA. So the USA is where it's domiciled, but actually the economic activity we're plugging into let me offer you this, Kane. I don't think it's a direct answer to your question, but it's, it's worth mentioning. The domicile of the con of the the domicile by country of the stocks we own is about fifty percent USA and then rest of world in varying proportions. The underlying economic activity, so where American Express cardholders are, where um, Taiwan Semiconductor ships its chips to, um, where Sonova sells its hearing aids, a Swiss company. 
that's about a third in the Americas, a third in Europe, Middle East and Africa, and a third in Asia. And so the underlying, this goes back to the point about, is this the moment for the oath of optimism? PayPal is interesting, not because it's American, not because it's domiciled in California, none of those things. It's, it's attractive because more and more people worldwide are using it. Disney, one of its biggest attractions, two of its biggest attractions are Indonesia and India, but it's domiciled in Burbank, California. So we, we don't ignore the points you've asked about, far from it. Um, but we just don't find them particularly useful in, in suggesting what should be bought today or tomorrow. Okay. I've got one more question that sort of leads on from what you were just talking about. Um, how do you approach investing in some of these emerging market countries? Is it through listings that are, you know, not in these countries or, you know, I'm, I'm talking about from a transparency point of view or rule of law point of view, using China as the example here, how, how would you approach getting access to that market? Well, well China is a particular example. And there are, there are two challenges that we have found nigh on insurmountable and others have not, they, and, and many of them have had better returns in, in, their, in their Asian investments than we have. And the two things in, in the case of China are um, many, <coughs> the, the state-owned companies. So if the first name is China something, it's almost certainly state-owned. And um, some, a lot of them have things called ADRs, which are they list their shares on the, in USA. And if they do that, uh, they have to disclose uh, accounting information to the same standard as US companies do. <clears throat> those disclosures tell you that the Chinese company you're looking at is majority controlled by um, a state-owned enterprise. We struggle to reconcile the interests of the Central Committee of the Communist Party with us as shareholders. Number two, lots of the Chinese companies that are primarily listed outside of China do so via a complex mechanism called a VIE, a Variable Interest Entity. Um, and I'll spare you the details, um, but we struggle with that too in terms of title. Now, your question was about accounting information and by implication, you know, what's the corruption levels and so on. <clears throat> the way I've always answered this is I'm living here in Edinburgh, where the biggest banking fail failure in Western Europe ever took place in 2007, the Royal Bank of Scotland, by a board of directors that were absolutely incompetent, inept, and it is arguable that some of the things they said were downright misleading. So we don't have to go far for corporate malfeasance. Look at Wirecard in Germany. Um, that, those, those concerns are not monopolies of so-called emerging economies. And furthermore, some of the disclosures in uh, emerging economies are just as good as they are in Western economies. The, the pendulum swinging, the investor relations material from some developed market countries is now so, it's, um, it's finance porn. It's, it's so elegant and salacious and telling you how good the company is. If that's all you read, you might only get a, a frivolous interpretation of what it would do. You have to study the numbers in more detail. However, there are liquidity, liquidity questions in some of these countries. And the one in particular that we struggle with is <clears throat> most Indian companies don't bother with um, ADRs in New York, and we don't yet have a license to invest directly in India. So the answer, long answer to your question is um, governance comes down to the way the business is run and what you can discern. The organization of the stock market, the regulatory rules, we rely on the same material everybody else does for that. Um, and so far, we've been content when we've dipped a toe in. But at the moment, the majority of our exposure in these economies is through developed companies. Um, I'll give, give you one example, and I'll shut up in this. AIA, the Hong Kong domiciled insurer, is in India through a joint venture with Tata Group. And that joint venture is not exclusive to Tata. They can sell products through non-Tata entities, including HDFC Bank and others. Very, very happy to have our exposure to Indian life insurance and health insurance through AIA, Tata, and ultimately up into AIA because I'm confident in the disclosures about AIA there. And that applies in, in lots of examples uh, around the world. Thank you. I've got one more question. Um, you know, we've seen in the US uh, fiscal stimulus in excess of 26% of GDP. You know, we've seen 
the levels around the world. We're starting to hear some countries talk about raising taxes, presumably to, to pay for this. How do you think the debt burden will be um, dealt with going forward? Well, there's only one way it can be dealt with over the long haul, and that is to hold the nominal value of the debt relative to GDP. Um, that has been the uh, that's been the way since the Bank of England, and before that, the Dutch Central Bank uh, was established in the 1690s. Um, uh, and yes, the, the there has been a, a dramatic stimulus. That stimulus will generate tax receipts. Um, and so not all of it, I mean, it's, it's one of these things where there's a degree of self-fulfilling um, element to it. <clears throat> uh, but as we know, you know, the whole point of long-term government debt is to incur expenditure that can be bought up by very, very long-dated investors. Um, and we're, get, we're getting more of those as the boomers retire, there's more and more people want that kind of paper. So the only way this is going to be dissolved is via that GDP growth. Now, um, that GDP growth can be real or nominal, or both. And the nominal part will depend on what the CPI is in, in the USA. And that is a question. That is a question. And uh, it's a question that will, you know, as it stands just now, the anti-inflationary tools that we have. I'm, I'm not in the camp of fearing it very much, but I acknowledge the, the, the question. Um, the tools we've tended to use have been to put up interest rates. Um, and it's a question of whether we'd be able to do that this time, whether governments could indeed control interest rate rises. Uh, they've done it before. Um, or whether Mr. Market would drive bond yields higher. I would, I would simply remind you that the greatest decade in the entire 20th century for long run for equity returns was the 1950s, when global equities compounded up in real terms at nearly 15% per annum from a very low base post-World War II. <clears throat> but that was a period in which the real return on US treasuries was negative. So what we've been used to is 30 years of positive real bond returns and strong equity returns. Uh, and so the question might be, if, if some of that debt is to be addressed by GDP growth as inflation, you know, it's not real growth, but there's a, the nominal growth has the two components. Um, it's perfectly possible that we have a period uh, of negative uh, bond returns. It's certainly hard to forecast bond yields going much lower. But if you want a real nightmare on that one, look up Dr. Paul Schmelzing and his paper to the Bank of England recently because he's he's got some interesting predictions in that area. Oh. Not, not my subject. Yeah, no, no, it was a yeah, macro question, but I thought I'd throw it out there. Thank you very much for your time this morning, your time, Alan. Um, you know, it's, I hope everyone at home has gained some valuable insights into into Dundas and you know if you've got any further questions do feel free to send them through and we'll be happy to help um yeah do keep an eye out for our next fund manager webinar which will be going out shortly so an invite for that will be going out shortly otherwise yeah thank you again for listening and and thank you Alan for for your time today and and Will and Kane, thank you we always appreciate doing this and thank you uh, for your interest bye-bye Thank you very much, Alan.